Good morning. I hate to interrupt good fellowship, but the clock on the wall says nine o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our worship service this morning. We want to welcome each and every one of you. We're glad that you chose to be with us here at Bobby Branch for our Sunday morning worship service. And we especially want to extend a warm welcome to those who may be visiting with us. And if you are visiting, we would ask if you would fill out one of the visitor's cards located on the back of the pew. Once you've completed that, if you'll leave that on the pew, then those will be collected following services. Our congregation does meet each Sunday morning, this time for a period of worship. will be followed at 1015 by a period of Bible study. And then we have evening worship at 6 p.m. and our midweek Bible service at 7 p.m. So um, if you are here with us, and you're in search of a home congregation, we want to encourage you to certainly uh, be with us today through both services and get to know some of us here and certainly meet with our elders and learn more about what this congregation is doing to spread the gospel as well as edify ourselves in God's word. So, This morning, I do want to start off uh, with those that we know of that um, continue at home sick and uh, ask you to keep each one of these and their families in your prayers. Uh, Sister Helen Morgan. A thank you card from Deborah C. and Nelma Chilton. Uh, dear Bobby Branch family, thank you for all the cards, calls, visits, and especially prayers during my surgery and rehab at NHC. Please continue to remember, re remember us as, I, as we're re recovering. Deborah C. and I love and miss you all. So and I'll put this card on the bulletin board for everyone to view. A couple of other areas that uh, just to remind the congregation. Tonight is a very special night for us. Tonight's our holiday fellowship meal. So the room, the fellowship room has been prepared and uh, I know that meals are being prepared. If you haven't already signed up, please sign up if there's something you would like to bring. But we more, most importantly want you there. And so don't feel obligated that you have to bring something, but please we want to uh, all get together for a period of fellowship this evening and that will be following our services. Uh, Jason asked me, uh, and, to, and we want to thank the congregation too for all the for everything that everyone did as part of the holiday gift giving. Uh, this is where we select some families uh, through the help of some others in the community, and try to help them during the holiday season, and give them some gifts and some things to help them. Uh, they're having a difficult time uh, through this, so uh, for a heartfelt thanks. Uh, those gifts and things will be delivered this week. And, uh, and again, to especially a lot of the young people and the parents that were involved in that effort. There will be a holiday gathering for the youth, and that will be this Tuesday. Uh, Jason, Tuesday evening, what time? Six. Well, what was the last part? Hickory Creek Gym, Tuesday at 6 o'clock at the Hickory Creek Gym. And all the uh, youth are reminded to bring a $5 gift card. So. Also want to remind the congregation, we're getting to that time of the year, the year's almost gone, and we've still got some calendars in the back. We ordered some extra calendars, and so this is a good time. I know many of you probably already have calendars, probably maybe already have them hanging up for next year, uh, but uh, if you have someone in your neighborhood, someone you work with, someone you know, it's a good time of the year to get them one of those calendars and encourage them to read the Bible. There is a daily Bible reading calendar, it's what it is, and, and you could read the entire Bible in a year's length of time. And so it's a good time as an outreach 
to try to encourage those to come to know God's word and study it on their own. But station group three, you're reminded of your meeting this evening following services and will be in room one. If you would please stand at this time, our first hymn will be number 660, number 660. There is Would you please bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Our Holy Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts for blessing us with another first day of the week. We are so thankful, Heavenly Father, for each member that worships here, for the love and the fellowship and the concern that we have for each other. Please help us to grow spiritually and to be patient with each other, that we, may, that we may seek only the good in our brothers and sisters and edify each other as we try to do your will. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for this community we live in, where the church is so strong with many, many sound congregations that want to teach your word in spirit and in truth. We're thankful for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus that we will spend eternity with you in heaven when this life ends. Heavenly Father, we have so many material blessings, too numerous to mention, and we know all of these good blessings come from you, and without you, we would not have anything. Please bless the sick, help those who work to restore their health, that, they, that those sick may once again be able to enjoy life and be back with us and worship to you. Bless all of those of our number who have been mentioned this morning. Please bless and comfort them in their time of distress and give them strength to endure the hard times. Please, Heavenly Father, at this time we want to ask a special blessing on our dear sister, Therese again. Cancer has once again invaded her body. Please help her to endure the difficult treatment she is facing 
And if it be your will, may this dreaded disease be cured, that she may enjoy many more years with her loved ones and her church family. May all of us continue to pray for her physical and mental strength. Heavenly Father, we know that we are sinful creatures. We often do things that are not pleasing to you, and we ask that you forgive us of those shortcomings. Also, we know we leave undone things that we should be doing. We also ask for forgiveness of these sins. Please continue to bless this congregation. Give us a peace of mind. Give us courage to continue to teach your word, which is our only hope for eternal life. Heavenly Father, please be patient with our country at this time. It seems the wicked continually try to rid our society of you and your word. Help us to elect those people who fear God and want to keep your word in our society. Heavenly Father, this morning we ask that you bless Tony and Coretta. We know that Coretta has been very sick lately. Give her the strength to endure and face the hard times in her life. Also strengthen Tony as Coretta's sickness is a hardship on him. This morning, Heavenly Father, please bless Tony as he breaks unto us the bread of life. Help us to understand those wonderful words of life, to put them to use in our lives that we may be a shining light in this wicked world. And as, I, <clears throat> as always, Heavenly Father, please forgive us of all of our sins. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our next song will be number 708. Number 708. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight on my journey over the mountains through the deep well, Jesus has said. instructs us that we meet upon the first day of the week. Upon that first day of the week, we have the opportunity that's been given unto us to return a portion of the blessings that God has blessed us with in our life. 
We indeed live in the most abundant, wealthy country in the world. We're all blessed supremely from the richest to the poorest. We not bless the same, but all have some. And we have this opportunity now to tell God, thank you. Thank you for what all you have blessed us with, what all you have done for us. Also the opportunity to show God how much we love him. Because we return this portion of all of the blessings we have. We return it with love as we say thank you to God. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, dear God, that you watch over us, you care for us, you, you watch over us, and you bless us, dear God, that we live in this wonderful country, that we have the means and the opportunity to, to, to move about, that we have jobs, we have incomes, we have monies coming in, and we have the health, dear God, that we can conduct our activities. We know we're supremely blessed. We know that you, you give us these blessings, dear God, with, with the expectation that we will be good stewards of what you have blessed us with. We ask, dear God, that we might have the wisdom to what correctly discern how to use this abundance of goods that you've given to us, that we might deem what is really and truly important and not frill away our blessings upon frivolous things in this life. Help us, dear God, that as we return this portion unto you, that we will do so lovingly, freely, saying thank you for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Following the lesson this morning, the invitation was seat number 588, 588, as now as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 359, 359. Jesus, Jesus.
It is all too easy living in this life, especially at this time of year, to, be, to get caught up in the affairs of this world, in the affairs of this life, in the mundane, and we sometimes forget the eternal. It's a wonderful opportunity that we now have as we gather together as Christians, as we gather together at God's family, to be reminded of what is truly important. And what is important is God tells us in his word that he loved us so much. He loved you so much that he gave his son to die upon that cross. And that his son, even though he was labored in that garden of Gethsemane, wanting that agony and that cross and what he was called upon to do put away from him, he agreed to the will of his father. Not my will, but your will be done. And he died upon that cross, freely giving himself so that we might have a pathway to have eternal life. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, he being the first fruits, and that sets up the, the opportunity for each one of us. We need to be reminded that everything that we look at in this world, everything that we hold as important, everything that we cling to, is going to pass. We're going to pass. We're not going to last forever. Our souls will. So we need to be reminded of what's important. We're loved by God. We have a Savior who died for us. And we now have this wonderful opportunity of coming together and to partake of the Lord's Supper, to be reminded of how much we're loved and what all he has done for us and the great sacrifice of the sinless Lamb of God given for our stead, for our sins. We will be taking of the, the bread first and then the fruit of the vine. We will pray to God for both. And there will be opportunity after each prayer for your own prayers, your own meditation. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, dear God, for each blessing that you give us in this life. And we know that's many. But when we reflect upon what's truly important, the eternal, we know that you gave your son to die upon that cross and that he lovingly and freely gave of himself and he hung there in, in pain and agony and shame upon that cross. He endured what we will never know or what we will never truly understand for our behalf. As we partake of this bread, which through our faith, dear God, represents the body of your son who hung upon that cross and died upon that cross. May we realize how much we're loved and may we realize what a great price was paid so that we might have a pathway to redemption and salvation and forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. We will now go into prayer for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, in like manner, accept our thanks, dear God, for the offering of the blood of your Son, that he died upon that cross and shed his blood, the blood to, to wipe away the sins of mankind. We're thankful, dear God. We'll never understand it, but we are so thankful for his sacrifice, for what he gave up, he gave up the joys of heaven and lived upon this earth, walked among mortal man, lived as we lived, and he died on our behalf. We're so thankful, dear God. We love you and we love that sacrifice that your son made on our behalf. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
reading will come from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. I would invite your attention this morning to the book of Luke, chapter 15, again, if you'll just keep your Bibles open there. We're going to talk about lessons from lost things. And I want to begin, first of all, by asking the question, have you ever lost something? I know many of you would say, oh yes, I lost my pencil, I misplaced my car keys, but I'm talking about, have you ever lost anything of real great value or real significance to you? Uh, earlier this year, when we traveled to the Bible lands, and we got out at uh, Mount Zion, and I looked around and I said, where's my gimbal? And I couldn't find it, and I'd spent a lot of money for that. And we walked and walked, and I couldn't enjoy what I was looking at because I was worried about what I had lost, and I got back on the bus, and right there it was, sitting in my seat, right where I had left it, and uh, you know, you think about things like that, something of great value, and it concerns you, it worries you that you may have lost it. Second question, have you ever been lost, and I mean really lost, I'm not talking about you've driven into a neighborhood and you'd say, I'm not sure if I'm at the right place or not. Or maybe you've taken a wrong turn. But I'm talking about somebody who is lost and you don't know if you'll ever find your way back. Again, if you don't mind, a personal illustration. When I was a child, my best friend and his brother and sister had come to our house to play. We were going to go back to his house and rather going the road, we decided we were going to go through the woods. And uh, we got turned around, and for about two or hours plus, we were lost in the woods. Our parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles, everybody was out looking for us. I remember when we crossed Hell's Creek on an old log going across the creek. We didn't know where we were, didn't know if we'd ever make it home again. And so when you start thinking about things like that, perspective really matters. Because it's one thing if it's you, it's another if it's someone else. For instance, if someone loses an old photo, I'd say, well, just take another one. But you realize in that photo may be somebody that was precious to you, that has since passed, and that photo can never be recalled again. Or maybe you've been given an old pocket knife by your grandfather, and someone would say, well, that's okay, you can go buy another one just like it. Oh, but no, it, it was his. Or maybe you lost your grandmother's wedding band that had been given to you by her and you now do not know where it's at and you feel such remorse, you feel such guilt because you no longer have it. You see, perspective matters. If it's yours and it belongs to you and you've lost it, it really matters. Now, that's Luke chapter 15, if you will. You see, there are two groups that are present with our Lord. Brother Marty read to us verses 1 and 2. And you read, first of all, about those who were the tax collectors and those who were the sinners. And they had such a, a view of themselves was that they were in great need of being saved. Listen to chapter 18 and verse 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat himself on the breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can't even look up to God because I don't even feel worthy to do that. The man who was a tax collector, those who were sinners, <coughs> viewed themselves as truly needing God, and it was by God's mercy that they were able to be saved. But in contrast, those others who were there were the scribes and the Pharisees, and their view of themselves is also recorded in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, and then verses 11 and 12. 
He spoke a parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. They looked at other people and said, they're not worthy to be me. They're not worthy to serve God. In verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He would look at himself and say, look how valuable I am. Look how not valuable those sinners are. Because of that, there was an entirely different view of how they ought to respond to God. Perhaps one of the very best passages that I can think of is found in Luke chapter 7. And it's so important because we read there and all the people, when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now pause with me for just a moment if you will. When they listened to Jesus and they listened to John they heard a message of rebuke that said, your sins have separated you from your God. And they said, we need God. And so they came to be baptized because baptism was for the remission of sins. But you get to verse 30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves not having been baptized by him. You see, they didn't listen to John. They didn't choose to be baptized because they said, we really don't need it. We're righteous enough on our own. You folks, that's Luke 15. You see, Luke 15 addresses the attitude toward the sinner. Is he worthy of being saved? And what are you and I trying to do to try to reach out and save this person? What is our attitude toward them? Well, I know if you've ever studied Luke 15, you know there's a very easy three-point outline that represents the text. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. That's plural, lost sons. If you will, for a few minutes, let's explore these passages here. Let's begin, first of all, in verses 3 through 7. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and goes after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and fam neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for me, rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents more than 99 persons who need no repentance. When I explore that, I realize that tending sheep was a very common profession. They lived in an agrarian society that was so different from ours. You know, today we do so many other things. But the people there lived off the land, and having sheep was very common. And also very common was the fact that sheep would wander off. They were noted for straying, if you will, in fact, Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Now, when I look at this passage, I've got to recognize the passage is not about sheep. The passage is about what verses 1 and 2 talk about, and he's talking about the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees, and their attitude was, I don't stray. I'm one of those sheep that's, Never straying. I'm the one of the good ones. And when he would look at the one who would stray and be lost, he would say, it's their fault. They deserve what they got. If they fall into a crevice, if they fall into a pit, if they were killed by a wild animal, they shouldn't have been out there straying to start with. 
They were passive. They were unconcerned with the fate of the lost. When you're reading the parable of the lost sheep, don't think all about these other things. Think about the attitude of that sheep and how the one who, ex who lost the sheep was so thrilled when he found it. And think about what is said. There's more joy in the presence of the angels of heaven over one sinner who repents. It's all about the importance and the value of the soul. And when I go to passages like Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14, Jesus said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to seek or come to save that which was lost. What do you think? And then he uses that same parable. And in verse 14, even so it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God loves and cares for every sheep. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who desires that all men be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Appreciate the value of the sheep. Number two, let's look at verses 8 through 10. And there we read of what woman, having ten coins, silver coins, if she loses a one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, Search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I know that when you read this, passage, it may somehow not resonate with us because of our culture today. But I will tell you that the coins that this woman had, they were silver coins, would have been a Greek drachma. The size of it would probably have been close to our quarter. But the value of it was a day's wage. So you're talking about a woman who had 10 days wages with her and she lost one of them. But there's something even more impressive than that. Coins were joined or strung together as what we would sometimes look at as a face mask. Those coins would be joined together. And they would signify that a woman is married, much like a wedding ring does today. And it was a part of her dowry so that if something would ever happen, she would always have that with her. And now if she has lost one of those, she's going to look for it diligently. She's going to put the lamp. She's going to light it. She's going to sweep the house. She's going to look at every place to try to find it. And when she does, she is thrilled with what she has found. Now, for some of us, we might look and say, well, it was just a silver coin. Some of you may have a quarter in your pocket and have a hole in your pocket. Next thing you know, I thought I had some change there and it's gone. Oh, well, no big deal. Other people may look at larger sums of money and think, oh, that's not worry about that. That's not significant. You see, the problem is rich people don't understand the value of small things. In fact, 16 times in Luke's account, he talks about people and their money. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, verses 23 through 25, you have a young man who has come to Jesus. He's wanted to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to go and sell what he had. And it says, when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful. He said, how hard is it is for those who are riches or have riches to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He knew that rich people struggle with this. For many of us, when we read the parable of the lost coin, that's no big deal. That's perhaps because we've got so much. 
But we have to remember that he's not talking about coins, just like he wasn't talking about sheep. He was talking about the value of a soul. And in Matthew 16 and verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or will what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Talk to the rich man. Ask him, rich man, when you and Lazarus died, what good were all your riches when you died? He would say absolutely no value whatsoever. But the value of the soul is the point. Now let's go to the third one. I would say probably the one that most of us are most familiar with. I'm going to try to go through this text rather quickly. It's a long reading. We read there, then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Oh, you can uh, visualize exactly what has happened here. And in verse 14 through 19, he talks about what occurs while he is there in that foreign land. It says there arose a severe famine in the land. He began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into his field to feed swine, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Think about that statement that he says, I'm going to say, I am no more worthy to be called your son. Then you read what happens in verses 20 through 24 as he returns to his father. He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father came and saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. They're thrilled, they're happy because this son who has been gone is now back and his father is not hatred and harsh toward him. He's just thrilled to have his son back. But you get to the crux of the passage now in verses 25 and following. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And so he called one of his servants and asked, what are the these things mean or what they meant and he said to him your brother has come because he has received the, him safe and sound your father has killed the fatted calf and, but he was angry and would not go in therefore his father came out and pleaded with him and so he answered and said to his father lo these many years I have been serving you I have never transgressed your commandment at any time and you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours who had devoured your livelihood with harlots came and uh, you have killed the fatted calf for him. And he said, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It is right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. 
You see, when you read this passage, you realize the illustration that is used was quite common. A man who had a livelihood, he's drawing near the end of his life, and he's going to divide his inheritance, and he's going to give his older son twice as much. He had two sons. And according to chapter 21 and verse 17 of Deuteronomy, it says that the firstborn is given a double portion. What that would mean is the older son got two-thirds and the younger son got one-third. He knew what he was going to get. It's not uncommon to read in the biblical times where a parent would begin to distribute his wealth, his livelihood among his children. That even happens today as those who sometimes get older, they begin to transfer their wealth to their children before they pass from this life. And their children make sure that they're taken care of. It wasn't also uncommon to have a rebellious son who was wasteful and lazy. In fact, Solomon talks about that. I would love to spend a lot of time talking about what Solomon said, but I go to passages like chapter 10 and verse 1 of Proverbs. He said, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Chapter 29 and verse 3, whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots waste his wealth. Chapter 21, verse 17, he who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Chapter 28, verse 19, he who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows frivolity will have poverty enough. You see, Solomon recognized he didn't want his son to turn out like that. But you know, when we study this parable, I would ask you, what would you call this parable? Most of us would say this is the parable of the prodigal son. Because we focus on him rather than on the pious, self-righteous older brother. And when we do, we miss the point. The point of this parable is not the prodigal son, the point of the parable is the elder brother. You see, the elder brother represents the Pharisees and the scribes, and the younger brother represents the sinners. And if you think about the elder brother, he was selfish and he was heartless. He wanted it all for himself, and he did not care what happened to his brother. You see, that's the point of the parable. On the other hand, the younger brother became humble and repentant and was welcomed back by a gracious and a loving father. I don't know that I could impress upon you how important of a message that is to talk about. We focus on the mistakes of the prodigal son, and they were many. But the focus of this parable is on the repentance of that prodigal son and the change that he brought about in his life and the attitude that was possessed by that elder brother. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, we read, Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw that, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, what the Lord was dealing with was an attitude of heart. The attitude of heart that these people out here who are lost, who are sinners, we have so many people who say, I don't care about them. I'm sitting here in church and I'm singing, oh, how I love Jesus. And I'm not out there committing the same sins that those people are committing. But let me tell you something. The Lord loves them just like he loves us. Now, clearly, these parables were to teach the value of the soul. 
And I will tell you, if your life resembles that of the prodigal, I want you to know that God loves you just like the father in this parable does. He's wanting you to come home. In fact, he is pleading with you and he's watching for you. But you're going to have to do like the prodigal son. You're going to have to make that first step that says, I'm going to go home. I'm going to see what I can do. On the other hand, if your life resembles these pious, self-righteous Pharisees, then you need to remember that you also have been saved. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. There is no one of us who can look at someone else and say, my soul's worth more than your soul. I am better than you are because all of us are saved by the grace of God. All of us have been forgiven of our sins because there's none righteous, no, not one. I want to end with a couple of passages that I think are so important with regards to this. The first is found in Luke chapter 9 and verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. James and John, you don't understand your attitude. I didn't come to condemn people. I came to save people. When you get to Luke chapter 19, there's a little man by the name of Zacchaeus who had climbed up into the sycamore tree. He was a tax collector. He wanted to see Jesus. There were people fussing about that. Jesus said in Luke 19 and verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so I would ask this morning, will you let Jesus save you? We're going to sing the song of encouragement. Sinners, Jesus will receive. And if you need to become a child of God by faith in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing that faith and being baptized, Please come and let that be known. And if for some reason you can't do that right now, maybe someone's listening on our stream and they're saying, I, I know I need to be safe. You get in contact with us. Your soul is too valuable to let it pass from this life without being prepared to meet God. If you're a Christian and you need to repent of sins in your life, we can pray with you. Let's stand and sing. Sinners, Jesus <coughs> will receive word of grace to all the heavenly all the
27. Thank you, Tony, for that good lesson that we studied together this morning. And Caleb, thank you for the excellent song service. And we want to thank each of you for your attendance. We have some visitors, and we're glad that you're here. We want to invite you to come and worship with us at every opportunity that you may have. And also to our visitors, we have some packages on the table out in the vestibule that when you leave, we'd like for you to pick up. It tells the story of the church here at Bibles and take it home with you and use it for your enjoyment. Want to remember those who are sick in our daily prayers to call them or visit, whatever we can do to make their day rejoiceful. We want to express our sympathy to the prior family from the death of one of their members of their family. We pray that God will comfort and bless them and give them strength and courage as they go through this difficult time in their life. Visitation group three, please remember your meeting tonight following our service. Our service will be at 6 p.m. Then after service, we're going to have pecan pie, Stanley. Stanley's hoping for pecan pie, but he doesn't need it. But anyway, we want everyone to stay for our fellowship this evening uh, after our worship period and enjoy one another for a period of time. And then Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. at Midweek Bible Study. We want to sing this final song that will be led in our dismissal prayer. Oh, the way we journey may be often drear. We shall see the kings of death On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the kings of death We shall see the Father God in heaven, just want to thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you bless us with, allowing us this opportunity to come here to praise you, to sing these songs, encouragement to one another, and to hear a message of your word. Well, we just pray that we've heard this lesson that Tony's presented to us, that when we look at people, we can look at them as lost souls and try to bring them into your fold. Father, there are many that were mentioned this morning who are sick and afflicted, some who have cancers that have returned. Father, we just ask you to place your healing hand upon them, that you can bless their lives, bless those that are around them, you can bring them back to much wanted health. Fathers, we work in this community and we work in our little social circles, we just pray that you give us the opportunities we can in order to serve the people around us and show them that your light is shining through us. 
I ask you to go with us now as we go to our Bible classes. We can open our hearts and our minds at things that are prepared and we can learn more from, from about you. Just watch us through the remainder of this day, Lord, and keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.